Hello and welcome, class, to this, the culmination of Chapter 11, wherein we discuss kinetic molecular theory. Now, we have been discussing, again, every uh, thing in Chapter 11, all of our gas laws and discoveries in the historical context uh, with which they were discovered chronologically. And even though the textbook discusses kinetic molecular theory first, it is actually what comes at the end of our story. So what is kinetic molecular theory? How is it derived? And how is it the culmination of everything that we have talked about thus far? Well, before we answer that question directly, we actually need to talk about one last gas law. This law was the tipping point for the scientists that we're going to be talking about in a moment who uh, developed kinetic molecular theory. So it is, again, important that we discuss this very last gas law. So this last gas law was developed by Thomas Graham, who lived from 1805 to 1869. Uh, and what Graham studied was the diffusion and effusion of fluids. So diffusion, by technical definition, is the spread of one substance into another. So it could be a gas in a gas. It could be a gas in a liquid. It could be a liquid in a liquid, you get the idea. So long as we have two substances present, as we can see here on the left, diffusion is the uh, resulting phenomenon of this first substance being added, spreading out into and amongst the other substance, where even without stirring, assuredly over time and due to the uh, like natural kinetic motion of the liquid particles, we're going to see the blue slowly spread throughout and create an even homogeneous mixture with the rest of this, uh, you know, water in the flask. Effusion, on the other hand, is the process of moving through an opening from a high pressure region to a low pressure region. So this may be uh, a container that contains something moving into a vacuum. It could just simply be high pressure to low pressure, but suffice to say that this pertains predominantly to gases. So diffusion could be gases or liquids. Effusion, we are solely focusing on gases here. Now, the effusive process that we can see uh, diagrammed here on the right um, doesn't really show motion too well, right? It's a static picture. So we have to keep in mind that these gas particles are moving. And as these gas particles move and bounce off of the wall, sure enough, there is going to be a chance, some statistical likelihood that a particle is going to move through, <laughs> I missed the hole, is going to move through this open hole here onto the other side. Now, the reason why we define effusion as uh, high pressure moving to low pressure simply has to do with the statistical likelihood of particles moving through the hole. If there are fewer particles on the right hand side, there is a lower chance that they're going to bounce around and make their way to this one specific pinhole in the center. However, on the left hand side, we have more particles, which means more pressure. As we have discussed before, numbers of particles is directly proportional to pressure. So the more particles we have, the more these things are going to be bouncing around, bouncing off of each other, and the more likely it is that they're going to find their way through that hole until pressure equilibrium is reached and there is no net motion from one side to the other. Graham's law observes these rates of effusions. So we're just going to put a pin in diffusion really until chapter 12, and we're going to focus on effusion and Graham's law of effusion today, which was published in 1846. So the rate of effusion as measured via the root mean square speed or velocity represented by our variable u, velocity slash speed, and I know like slap on the wrist because I'm using these two terms interchangeably when in physics they have technical differences. In this chemistry class, again, we're not really paying attention to vectors, so I'm gonna use these two things interchangeably. Now root mean square or RMS is a means of averaging. So really what we're looking at are average speeds via the root mean square averaging process. All right, so the rate of effusion as measured by this root mean square speed is inversely proportional to the root 
of the molecular or molar mass as represented by variable capital M sub W. In other words, Graham's law states the more massive something is, the slower it is. And the less massive something is, the faster it will be. In a straightforward sense, this definition is totally consistent with physics, right? Like the more inertia something has, the more effort it takes to get it moving quickly. Uh, so the more massive a particle is, the slower it's going to naturally move unless we really pump the energy into the system to get it to move faster. All right, so in the uh, diagram or this graph in the center, what we are looking at is time versus molecular weight. So we're not necessarily looking at speed here, but rather we are looking at the time required for a 25 milliliter sample to effuse through a pinhole into a vacuum. So we're looking at how much time it takes for the effusion process to occur. Now we can see for very small things like hydrogen and helium, it takes no real time at all. All 25 milliliters of the sample are properly effused by the time, or like even before we hit 10 seconds. That's a testament to how fast these particles are moving, fast speeds, high speeds, as a result of low molecular weight. Conversely, we can see the further up we go on this graph, up to the upper right, we have very large molecular weights uh, where sulfur dioxide is the most massive species being observed here. And as a result, it takes the most time to effuse because it has the slowest root mean square speed. And the line that is connecting each of these things is the result of this time being proportional, not just to the inverse of the molar mass, but the inverse of the square root of the molar mass. So Graham's law is the first of all of our laws that is not just paying attention to a physical variable uh, with which we can you know, measure with like some type of flask or barometer, but is actually paying attention to energy in the form of velocity. So the incorporation of the velocity in Graham's law is the final piece of information that we need to develop our kinetic molecular theory, which is what we're getting to in a moment. Before we get there, let's spend a, just a little bit more time on Graham's law. Namely, let's compare our relative average speeds of particles. If we are observing two particles in much the same way that in the past with our previous gas laws, we were looking at like before and after situations. If here we are comparing two gases and both of which are at the same temperature, same temp, the ratio of the root of their molar masses, which is what we can see here, the ratio of one of the molar masses to the other, is also going to equal or describe the ratio of their speeds, which we can see on the left, where the speed of the first is in the numerator because we have this inverse relationship with the molar mass, which we can see in the denominator on the right-hand side, and vice versa. So we have root mean, squ root mean square speed of molecule one divided by the speed of molecule two is equal to the root of the molar mass of molecule two divided by the molar mass of molecule one. Now this relationship and the discovery of Graham's law is incredibly pivotal because up until this point, it had been assumed that same temperatures means same speed. So again, in Graham's law, we have a means with which to distinguish particles from one another. That molecular identity here does matter in much the same way that it did for the density calculation or the density equation that we uh, talked about or introduced at the end of the previous lecture. So with the, or with increasing evidence over time, over these hundreds of years of gas law studies, it's really beginning to look like Yes, we can in most cases assume that these particles are ideal and they're going to behave in the exact same way, but then we have things like Graham's law where the identity of the particle really does matter. All right, so keeping this in mind, 
let's determine which noble gas effuses 3.16 times slower than helium. So we're not given much information here, but we are given enough to calculate what noble gas is going to be moving slower than helium. And even without calculating anything, we're going to assume because this noble gas is moving more slowly, it will have a greater molecular weight than helium, right? If it's moving more slowly, it's gotta be bigger because it would take more inertia to get it to go any faster. All right, so I'm gonna get, let you guys digest this and we will come back together and determine which noble gas is moving slower than helium together. All right, so in setting up this problem, we find that we are not actually given any specific velocities. And in fact, we're not explicitly given any molecular masses, even though we can definitely find those on our own. All we're told is that this unknown noble gas, this question mark, moves 3.16 times slower than helium. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of logic here uh, in order to rework the wording of this problem into something that's, let's say, a little bit more straightforwardly meaningful to us. So the way that I personally go through these types of problems is not to focus on what's moving slower, but rather I focus on what's moving faster. The reason why is between atom one and atom two, just to go backwards in our uh, reworking of the Graham's Law equation here, atom one and atom two, I always define atom one as being the faster atom slash molecule. Now you don't necessarily have to take this approach. Uh, you would get the same answer if you said two was the faster molecule and everything was self-consistent. However, it pays to keep sort of like a constant perspective on this type of problem just to make sure that you're not tripping yourself up. So I try to find something consistent in working these problems and my consistency is that the faster atom is always number one because it's always gonna finish the race first. All right, so helium is going to be our number one, which means our question mark is going to be our number two. So I'm going to rewrite our previous, uh, or the equation from the previous slide, U RMS of helium, since this is atom number one, divided by U RMS of our question mark, which is atom two, is equal to the square root of the molecular weight of our question mark, divided by the molecular weight of helium. All right, so we're just plugging in the identities of our one and two at this point, because it's gonna help us to keep track of what variable's actually going where. All right, so let's start plugging in some stuff on the right-hand side. Our molecular weight of the question mark is ultimately going to be what we need to solve for, because if we know the molar mass of this unknown, all we have to do is check out the periodic table and find what molar mass in the heat or the uh, noble gas column matches this. So we're going to divide this molecular weight of the question mark by the molecular weight of helium. And if we look on the periodic table, the molecular weight that is listed for helium is 4.020 grams per mole. All right, so this ratio of the molecular weights underneath the root is equal to the ratio of the speeds. Now here's where the 3.16 comes into play. We're not given exactly what speed each thing is going, but we are told that what is on the bottom is going 3.16 times slower. This is logically the equivalent of stating that helium is 3.16 times faster. The reason why I'm or phrasing the problem like this is because it's easier to focus on the perspective of what's going faster because of the ratio of their speeds. If helium is going 3.16 times faster, then that means whatever number is present here in the numerator is gonna have to be 3.16 times bigger than what's on the bottom. 
So ultimately, it doesn't matter what speeds these molecules are moving or how fast they're going, all that matters is that the helium is going 3.16 times faster, meaning that our numerator is 3.16 times bigger than the denominator. So the equation ends up quite simply being equal to 3.16 is equal to the square root of our unknown molecular weight of the question mark, all divided by 4.020 grams per mole. So you might be asking yourself, Professor, if you're the one who wrote this problem, why didn't you phrase it from the perspective of helium in the first place? Why didn't I just come out and say helium is 3.16 times faster? Well, the reason why is there are going to be plenty of problems that also state, like this one, as I have it written, that something is going to be moving slower. And I want to be crystal clear that it's going to be easier to focus on what's going faster, and you can always reword the problem to shift the perspective into, or you can shift the perspective to be from that of the species that is going faster. Now, if you have a different way of setting up this type of problem that you learned in high school or a previous class, that's totally fine. But again, I'm gonna emphasize just for consistency sake, focusing on what's going faster is going to be the easiest way to set up this problem, especially if what is going fastest is going to be number one. If it's going fast, it's gonna cross the finish line first, and it also means that the ratio of the speeds, you don't have to do anything with, you don't have to manipulate in any way. The ratio of the spe or speeds is going to be equal to that 3.16. All right, so let's rearrange and solve for the molecular weight of our question mark by first squaring each side, and then we're going to take this 4.02 and multiply it up to the left-hand side. This is going to give us a final answer of 40.14 grams per every mole. And if we observe the periodic table to find a molar mass that is somewhere around 40, particularly in the noble gas column, what we are going to find is that the uh, noble gas identity of this question mark is approximately that of argon. So we can go through this problem again, plugging in argon's actual molecular mass in for this guy here. Uh, calculating the problem, we would end up with an answer of around 3.16, meaning that our helium is moving 3.16 times faster than that of argon. All right, with Graham's Law under our belt, let's finally tie up all of the loose ends. Let's finally talk about the birth of chemistry is a true field unto itself. Let's talk about kinetic molecular theory. Now this theory was published in 1857, which was nearly 200 years after Boyle's first gas law experiment. Now what made kinetic molecular theory so pivotal? Because as we start going through these individual points, they're going to seem really self-evident to us. And we have the distinct advantage of already knowing this, right? Like gases nowadays in much the same way as discussing whether or not a candle flame would be extinguished in a vacuum or in much the same way we can say like, well, of course, partial pressures are going to be added or additive like Dalton's law of partial pressure state. We have the advantage of already knowing the answer because we live in the future compared to what's going on in the past. The reason why kinetic molecular theory and these points that we're about to talk about as they were developed by Rudolf Clausius, right here, the gentleman himself. Uh, the reason why these are so pivotal is that these points that we're about to discuss explain the gas laws and how they connect and can be specifically explained by the naturally occurring kinetic motion of particles. Now we've been taking advantage of the knowledge that gases are in constant motion this entire chapter. It's how I explained Boyle's law. It's how I explained Amonton's law. It's how I've explained everything up to Graham's law of effusion. But physicists and chemists did not know this in the 16 to 1800s. They did not realize that these gas particles are in fact in constant motion. 
This conclusion is what Rudolf Clausius came to and published to much hate and despise in 1857. Why was his theory of the kinetic molecular motion of gaseous particles so contentious? Because it went in the face, at least on surface value, of Newton's laws. Right, Newton states that an object at rest should remain at rest until it is otherwise disturbed. And it did not make sense to the physicists at the time why a gaseous particle would just be moving of its own accord or moving of its own accord without prompting necessarily by another particle bumping into it. Right? These particles, these gaseous particles are just whizzing along all on their own as we understand it today, but the Newtonians could not make sense of this. They did not understand the connection between energy, temperature, and naturally occurring motion of tiny, tiny particles. It spat in the face of everything that Newton stood for. It did not make any sense. It was complete heresy to the monumental structure that Newton had built between calculus and physics and optics. Like, he was the guy. And who was Clausius to stand up to this giant in physics and say, you're wrong? But Clausius also asserted with experimental evidence that this kinetic molecular theory, also known as KMT, was the only way that he could figure out to explain how the gas laws came to be. Why was it that pressure and volume were inversely proportional? How was it that these particles were able to move at speeds inversely proportional to their mo uh, molecular weights? It only made sense if the following four tenets were true. And again, we have total advantage of looking at KMT and thinking that it's just commonplace, that it's common sense. And it may seem almost unnecessary to even talk about it in the textbook, particularly with the, like, the way that the textbook discusses it. But this is why I think it's so important to talk about the history of chemistry and the reason why we frame kinetic molecular theory as being so important is because chemistry as a study would not exist without it. After the publication of kinetic molecular theory, the physicists did not want anything to do with the blue collar chemists. And so we said, fine, we're gonna create our own field and we're going to make sure that our experimental evidence aligns with our theory and that our theory is not going to assert that the evidence is wrong. The evidence is our observation and our theories must adhere to it in an effort to explain what is going on in the naturally occurring world. Point one, ideal gas molecules are infinitely small, as in they take up no space of their own, and are separated by relatively long distances. So again, these are Definitions for ideal gases, not real gases. Real gases obviously take up their own space. But if we are observing the behavior of small molecules like nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, we can assume that the size of these particles does not matter. Therefore, we can assume that they're just point particles in agreement with the early work of physics. And these point particles we can see are separated by long distances, implying that there's not gonna be any type of like attraction, repulsion, interaction, these things are spread apart. This is what defines a gas relative to liquids and solids. Next, ideal gas molecules move constantly and randomly. And again, the second point is really what set off the Newtonians and really uh, caused them to like disown chemistry as a subfield of theirs. Ideal gases move constantly and randomly. It was the only way that uh, Boyle's law could be made sense of, that a Montan's law could be sense or made sense of. Um, it's really, in addition, the way that like Dalton's law and Henry's law could be made sense of. Like, why would the properties of gases be the way that they were if these molecules, if these particles were not moving constantly and randomly? It just didn't make sense. Point three. Ideal gases are not attracted, nor are they repelled by other gases. They are going to collide perfectly and elastically. So this we can see not only 
in the gif below, but we can also think of this uh, in terms of like, again, billiards, pool, or even, ironically enough, Newton's cradle where uh, one of these like little clacky balls is gonna come down, hit the rest of the set. It is going to stay in place, but as a result of the energy transferring through the set, cause this last little clacky ball to swing upwards and it will swing back down. And of course, we're gonna see this nice backwards motion. This is what it means to collide elastically. Last but not least, point four, the average kinetic energy of an ideal gas is proportional to the speed of the molecule, AKA its temperature. Now this point four also built off of point two, asserting that the motion of these particles was an inherent property of the particle itself, that gases must be in motion and their kinetic energy resulted from their persistent speeds. And the speed of course was measured via the temperature. So our kinetic energy equation down below, uh, we can see is a combination of a conventional equation in physics, as well as uh, one that Clausius derived himself. So first we have kinetic energy as represented by E sub K. And this is known to be equal to one half mass times velocity squared, right? Uh, energy is equal to one half mv squared. Pretty uh, like conventional equation in Newtonian physics or first semester physics, if you've taken it, even in high school, I'm sure you've seen a form of this equation. Now the version on the right uh, states that our kinetic energy is equal to also three halves times RT divided by Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number. So Avogadro's number we learned way back in first semester, just as a reminder, this is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever per the unit of the mole. So by the time Clausius was uh, working through these calculations, Avogadro had already determined what his value of, as we now call it, Avogadro's number was. Yes, three, two, if we set the second equation then equal to the third and rearrange and solve for our velocity, we can find an equation, we can derive an equation that we can use to predict what the speed of a molecule is with really the only variable being temperature. I mean, sure there is molecular mass in here as well. Molecular slash molar mass, and there is also a gas law constant R, but T is really the only value that we need to measure. If you know the temperature, you can predict with great certainty, thanks to our equation for kinetic energy, what's the speed of the molecule? All right, before we move on to actually using this equation, let's talk a little bit more about our gas constant R. In our previous lecture, we learned R all around the context of the ideal gas law. And I did say that there were two versions of R. The first version pertained to when we were measuring uh, pressures, volumes, you know, ideal gas law, PV equals NRT kind of stuff. Here is a great example where energies and velocities are being observed. And therefore we're gonna have to use the other form of our ideal gas constant, 8.314 per mole Kelvin. All right, so now that we have this last equation, the final tenant, the final principle of kinetic molecular theory, the controversial equation itself, let's again, take advantage of centuries passing, comfortable with the assertion that this equation is meaningful, that it tells us something about the universe. Let's calculate a speed for a molecule. But we're not gonna find just any speed. No, no, let's put it in more of a fun context. Let's determine which has the higher average speed, a Ferrari moving at 145, or 145 miles per hour, or a UF6 molecule at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. Here I also give you the conversion of miles per hour to meters per second. It's something that we're going to need to 
uh, compare these two different speeds to make sure we get them into the same unit. But I'm gonna let you guys dissect what we've talked about so far. The real challenge to this problem is not going to be plugging our temperature into the equation that we just learned, but rather making sure that the units are aligning, making sure that our answer actually makes sense. All right, welcome back. Let's calculate how fast this UF6 molecule is going at room temp, and then we're gonna call it a day. We're gonna call it a chapter. All right, so the equation that we're going to need is the one that we just learned. Our root mean square speed is equal to the root of three times R times T, all divided by molecular weight. Something else that we're going to need to kind of keep track of how our units are working together, but we haven't seen in a while, so I was waiting to see if anyone remembered this. One joule is equal to one kilogram meter squared per second squared. So if you're kind of curious how the units are actually working out, how they're playing together, this conversion is going to be super useful for us to be able to get into and out of the joule relative to something that's a velocity in meters per second. All right, so let's plug in what we have. We're trying to find the speed of UF6. Three is the number three. The gas constant, again, we need is the 3.14 joules per mole Kelvin. And our temperature is given to us in 25 degrees Celsius. Now, ever since we've incorporated temperature into our calculations, this chapter, it has been paramount to convert the temperature into Kelvin. Do we still need to do this? Yes. Not only are we still working with ideal gases and gas law calculations, but we can also see that there is a Kelvin in the gas law constant R. So we're gonna have to make sure that 25 degrees Celsius gets converted into 298.15 Kelvin. All right, so this temperature we can then insert into the equation 298.15 Kelvin here, all divided by the molecular weight of UF6. So if we use the periodic table to observe uranium and fluorine, we'd be able to find that the molecular weight or the molar mass is 352 grams per every mole of this compound. All right, so here now comes the tricky part. Before we calculate anything, we want to make sure that our units are going to work together. In the numerator, we have Kelvin canceling Kelvin, and we have, it looks also like mole up here is going to cancel with the mole down below. And what we are left with is joules and grams. Is this okay? To answer that, let's look at our conversion up here to see how the joule and the gram play together. And we can see that in order for the joule to play with the gram, it should not be just in the gram, but rather in the kilogram. This is going to allow for the joule to uh, cancel out the kilogram, and we will only be left with meters squared per second squared. This is what we want. So in order to remove this gram and get it into the kilogram, we're just gonna throw a conversion straight into the denominator of this equation. Perfectly algebraically valid, so long as we're keeping our parentheses straight, we're gonna convert this gram into the kilogram by dividing by 1,000 grams. This cancels out the Gs, which also means in our conversion up above, we're canceling out this joule with the kilogram, and all that's gonna be left numerically is meter squared per second squared. So inside of our equation, just to simplify a little bit, start crunching these numbers and see how everything is uh, playing together, how it's shaking out. So numerically, this is going to simplify to 2.11 times 10 to the four, and the unit again is going to be meter squared per second squared. Now this is great since we are within a square root, the square root is not just going to be applied to the number, but to the unit as well. So after we take the square root of 2.11 times 10 to the four, we find 145, and we apply the square root to the meter squared per second squared, and we find a meter per second. So here we have a velocity of our molecule present in meters per second. However, we can't just directly compare the two velocities we have. 145 miles per hour is not the same thing as 145 meters per second. 
So let's go one step further. Let's convert this meters per second uh, into miles per hour, where there is one mile per hour for every 0 0.44704 meters per second. And our conversion then ends up equaling 324 miles per hour. What's going faster, a sports car at 145 miles per hour or a UF6 molecule at room temp? Turns out that UF6 molecule is moving around three times faster than a Ferrari, uh, like getting up to near its max speed. So these molecules are very fast. They contain a lot of energy. And just to bring our kinetic molecular theory full circle, this internal energy, this high internal energy is what catapults these molecules seemingly spontaneously forward. It's not that the molecules are just spontaneously gaining energy. We're not breaking any of Newton's laws here. And that's the information really that we can take advantage of knowing. These molecules are just so small and they contain so much energy, they can't help but just move fast, seemingly on their own. But in reality, it's not on their own. They're not being catapulted by any interaction with any other physical object. Rather, they are being catapulted by their own internal energy. All right, I think that's pretty good for a chapter, don't you think? So now that we have rounded out everything, uh, we have completed all of the discussions, all of the sections that we need to talk about. Kinetic molecular theory uh, was early on in the chapter, even though, again, we discussed it last. So there are a couple of example problems here pertaining to using Graham's law and principle for the equations present inside of kinetic molecular theory. All right, if anything today was confusing, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to shoot me an email if you are in my class or drop a comment in the section down below. If you have any homework, please do your homework. And until next time, class is dismissed.